So one of the things that the person this morning talked about was um, understanding the parts of the question, right? The question itself is the stem, and then there are four wrong answers. Those are the foil, the foils, and then there's the correct answer. That's what every question has, a stem, a right answer, and four wrong answers. Many um, people who make problems with questions that they should have got right, they just blow something by going too quick on the, on the stem. And the previous speaker talked about how you might inadvertently add information or jump conclusions or twist elements in the stem. So yes, read the stem carefully. Eliminate the wrong answers. It's okay to guess, there's no penalty for wrong answers. And a lot of what I'm gonna talk about is how to make your guessing much better. Right, if you knew nothing about anything on the exam and were totally randomly answering, you should get a 20, right? One fifth of the question's right. So even when you know nothing, you have a 20% chance of getting the question right. But if you can eliminate three out of the five choices and you're down to two, you should get a 50. So if you say on a given exam, there might be 20 or 30 questions that you don't know the answer to, if you can make it so that you're guessing out of two or guessing out of three, that really will give you 10 more points on an exam. So that's what we're gonna talk about. Uh, often unfamiliar wordy information is wrong. Answer question, uh, questions that have all or none or never. We know that medicine just doesn't function that way. Those are often wrong. Um, choose gold standard answers. So if you read a paper in the Annals of Emergency Medicine first, we're gonna get a CAT scan on you for reading the Annals of Emergency Medicine. You might have a psychiatric disorder, you could be suicidal or more likely homicidal. But if you read that paper and then you saw a test question on some brand new treatment, that's probably not the answer. Gold standard stuff is the answer. Outdated treatments though, things that are clearly from the way back are wrong. And negative physician behavior is wrong. So mistakes. You didn't read the stem carefully. Lots of information about that this morning. Once you sort of get down to doing the best guess you can, don't second guess. Be done with it. Um, pacing yourself, particularly on the research exams for ABEM, is not really an issue. And um, for you know most exams you take in emergency medicine, pacing yourself is not the. It's not a race. It's not like. Remember the old days with the SATs where they made them too long just to see if people were fast enough readers. It was one of the ways they weeded people down. There are pictorial questions on these exams. And so a lot of times people get all twisted up looking at the picture and they, you know, you know, they get out of bounds and they should, after you've looked at the picture as best you can and sort of analyze it, by all means go down and look at the question because sometimes you don't need the picture or sometimes the pic pic the question will very much clarify what the picture is of. I mentioned that I'm sort of an adversarial test taker, and some of you are, are not. You have to harvest your test taking persona. So when I'm taking an exam, I wanna be angry and pissed off enough so that I'm not decompensated, that I stay focused, but I do feel that way. I'm an angry test taker. Some of you are like, you know, meditative, granola eating test takers. You know, you're doing your, oh, okay, you have a snack of granola. I'm not really sure, but they probably meant a nice thing by this. And you get into that mode. But whatever your test taking persona is, before you write an exam, you should sort of refine that thing and get back into this multiple choice test taking mode so that you can harness it the best you can. I, part of my adversarial um, sort of beliefs just reflect some of my experiences as a resident, and maybe I'm sensitive, but I remember a year when I took the in-service exam where you get through the whole instructions thing, and then there's the picture. And I'm looking at this picture, and it's a big black and white picture with a, I can't tell what body part it is, there seems to be a fold, and there's a purple thing in the middle. And um, I was like, what is that? And I'm looking at it, I'm like, this is not a good start. It's the very first question of the exam. I have no idea what I'm looking at. I mean, I'm a doctor, I, I finished medical school, I should at least be able to identify what I'm looking at. Um, and then I go to the question and I look at it and I realize that they've started out the exam with a great big close-up of an asshole. <laughs> and that it's a question about a thrombosed hemorrhoid. And you can't tell me that the people who wrote that exam were not laughing to themselves. But my feeling as the examinee was, all right, the gloves are off, you're gonna start that way. I would write to pistivity level number three instantaneously. And I was like, that's good. Pistivity level three is a nice focus level. Pistivity level five, I'm beginning to compensate. 
But anyway, know how much coffee you need so you don't, won't fall asleep, don't have too much so you're too jittery. When you're doing calculations, because there's always a few number questions, I've seen examinees who just get all wrapped into this and they keep calculating it over and over and over again and getting frustrated. You know, by all means, if the numbers that you get aren't one of the choices, think of another formula and check your units because you're doing something wrong. Don't lose a lot of sleep. These are sort of typical things. They ask you what the osmolarity is. And you know, those, you know, these are sort of typical jobs that are there. There's a few of these. I will tell you that as you get further along in the research, there's a lot less of this stuff. This is more on the primary certification exam and also on things like the in-service. All right, as I said, we're gonna talk a lot about guessing. It's not penalized. Let's just talk about how the items on the check question are randomized, because it's important to know this. They're randomized either numerically or alphabetically. So here's the stem, and let's say it's, I ask, what percentage of time something happens? So 10% will be choice A, 20% will be choice B, 50% C, 70% D, and 90% E. So they're gonna go from smallest to largest. And in the word questions, they're, gonna, they're going to go by alphabetical. So if, there's a, if the if choice A will be activate EMS, choice B will be begin CPR, Choice C will be cardiovert, but they'll be alphabetized. Now, there are some weird things about the English language that come out as a consequence of this and about writing exams. You see this point here. If you have no idea, choose B or D. Now, that turns out to be actually true, no matter how hard they try to make it not true. And the reasons are kind of simple. First off, if I write a number question and it happens close to none of the time, which is gonna be A or B, that's one not a really good question because it happens close to none of the time. And if it happens all of the time, that's gonna be E, also not a great question. 50-50, still not good. So you're already, already, and every medical student knows this, when a faculty member asks them a question, they're gonna say 20% if they think it's pretty uncommon because that's almost right for 10% all the way through 30%. Because B gives you a little bit of error on both sides, whereas A only gives you error on one side. And E only gives you error on the other side. So B and D turn out to often to be the right way to go with those. Now, we get to words. So when people write choices for exams, a well-written exam, and these are, you know, the exam you're coming to is very well written, all the questions have been checked, their Pearson correlation coefficients are known, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This, the choices should be as few words as possible. So they wouldn't say pick up the phone and call 911, that's too wordy. It will say, instead, activate EMS. One of the ways you make things fewer words is you start with the active part. You start the choice with a verb. Now that takes us to the English language and verbs. So, it turns out that a lot of verbs begin with vowels, more than non-vowel beginning verbs. And it turns out that, that vowels um, are not, A, E, I, O, and U, right? are not evenly distributed in the alphabet. A, E, and I are in the first half. And there's a lot more words, a lot more verbs, that begin with A and E than begin with O and U. The net effect of this is, again, B is the right answer. Um, so B and D is the right answer. The other, when I, when I was at, at, at McGill University and you'd get these exams that you couldn't finish and it was okay to torture students, you know, you'd say, how did you do on that test? And you'd say, well, man, I beat out. Where, that's where you put the ruler on B. <laughs> I beat out the last 20 questions. And you might say, well, why didn't you D out if it's B or D? Maybe you should have chose D, except D looks really stupid if the last 10 questions were true, false. D looks not so good in that situation, so you beat out. But anyway, that's just a little bit about mechanics of some of the weird things. There's a lot of science that have been done on this stuff. And while that's sort of useful, what I'm gonna to talk to you about now is much more useful. All right, don't study the last day, unless of course it's the only day you're going to study. Um, 
make sure that you're comfortable arriving at the place so you're not panicky or jittery when you get there. You know, these are in these weird little test centers. I, I think it's worth going there the day before and looking around and knowing where it is. You know, there's a security thing, get there early and all of that stuff. Um, dress comfortably, be, be ready to focus. It's, it's a long exam. It's a bit of a, um, you know, a focus test. It's a bit of a concentration test, so be ready for that. Practice doing exams. When you're doing practice questions, at this stage of the game, when you're months from the exam, it's fine to do them 20 at a time before you go to bed or in the afternoon or whenever you're doing them. But as you get closer to the exam, start doing them at least 100 at a time so that you get into that mode of being focused for longer. All right? On the computer, the questions are in blocks. Once you complete a block, you can't go back. That's, that, that was a little bit irritating for me because I used to save all the questions I wasn't sure of to spend more time on at the end. You can't, can't do that now. You have to answer the questions within the block. Once you leave the block, you're done. Obviously, you can't write on the test unless you want to write on the computer screen which you're taking it on. Um, I used to, that also I found as a problem because I'm one of those people who likes to cross stuff out, circle stuff on the exam. You'll be given scratch paper if you need it, but again, if this sounds really foreign and anxiety provoking to you, then go do a practice test at the exam so that you can get familiar with it. It's not that big an adjustment to make, but some people are very anxious about it, so if that worries you, go do that. All right, so the stem, right? The wrong answers, which are foils, and the correct answer. Now, you might think, because you don't write exams for people to take, as I have for years and years and years, you might think that the examiners get all excited about writing a good question. And you would be wrong. There are so many good questions to write. Writing a good question is easy. Coming up with four bogus answers, the foils, is really, really hard. I can tell you, anyone who's written questions will tell you this, coming up with four possible wrong answers that aren't outrageously stupid and also can under no circumstances be right is really challenging. That's why when you write an exam, and you've done these exams many times, the words Gian Bure, for example, happen over and over again on the exam. Things like Eaton Lambert happen over and over and over. Now, why is that? Why is that? Well, one, Gian Bure can be good for a neuro question, an infectious disease question, and a, uh, you know, a physical exam question. So it has a lot of utility, but it fits as a fake answer in a lot of things. So more than half of the time, the words Gian Bure show up on the test. They're not the answer but it means it's really useful to know something about it. And so as you take practice exams, I want you to pay attention to foils, which you tend to stumble on, which occur over and over again. Because it would be very high yield to then make a list of those foils, maybe it's 30 of them, maybe it's 100 of them, and go and learn three or four bullet points about each one. Because then you would know when it was the right answer, and you would be more confident ignoring it when it was put in there as filler. Um, this is not that important. There are research questions that they're gonna do for you. They'll, sometimes you'll see the same question over and over again on exam three or four times with slightly different wording and you'll be like, what's going on with this? And what they're doing is they're changing the wording and the choices a little bit so that the exam quest to find out which version of the question correlates best with passing. And we know that changing just a few words or choices in an exam question dramatically changes the way that question performs. I can write the same question with the same right answer and make it an easy question by making bad foils or make it a really hard question by making tough foils. The foils are where we're putting the emphasis here. And I want you as a test taker to realize how important the foils are and FOIL analysis is. So we're gonna spend some time talking about that. First thing I want you to understand is there's, there are different types of questions. If it's a fact, the meanest kind of question is, I ask you for a fact. You either know the fact or you don't. There's no figuring it out. So let's do a fact question. Which of the following does not transmit rabies to man? Very typical question written over on exams many, many times. And so you're there, here you are, taking the test. You're like, A, raccoon. Yeah, yeah, I think raccoons do. I'm pretty sure I'm all sorts of it. It was a big problem in the Southeast. 
Bee, skunks. Yeah, skunks too. They got it. Mongoose. Assholes. Why would I even care about mongoose? By the way, the exam writers are always smarmy about this. It turns out mongoose is actually a problem for rabies in the U.S. Virgin Islands. You didn't know that. You didn't care. You don't want to know it. You don't practice in the U.S. Virgin Islands. But in fact, mongoose is. But you don't know that. So you just go mongoose. I don't know. Why would I know? So question mark. Then you go rabbit. Mm, I don't think so. I don't think so. Rabbits. They're lagomorphs. I don't think so. And then you get to bats. Bats, definitely. I know about the bat story. So you know that A, B, and E all transmit rabies to man. So you're down to two. That's good. That means you've got a 50-50 chance of getting this question right, even if you don't know anything about choice C. You think D is the answer. But you should know better at this point that C, what is the chances that the examining group wants you to know this mongoose thing? So what we're talking about is one, a little bit of FOIL analysis, and two, a little bit of getting into the examiner's head. So you should stick to your guns and go with D and say, if it's mongoose, I don't care and I hope we all get it wrong. Because <laughs> that's stupid, I'm going with D. But there's no way to figure this out. There's no way to figure this out, but there's still the fact, even though it's a fact question, there is still a common sense component where I don't think they're going to want me to know that much about mongoose. I mean, Ricky Ticky Tavi and the whole thing, I don't think so. And so you should, you should stick to your guns and go with rabbit because mongoose is a little bit outrageous of them to ask. And that's putting yourself in the examiner's head a little bit. But fact questions, there's no figuring them out. All right, make the diagnosis questions. This is very typical stuff. 28-year-old woman on oral contraceptives, you're like, yeah, yeah, I got, the, oh, I got the birth control pills, presents with gradual onset chest pain, myalgia, shortness of breath. Pain is worse when she lies flat, which is the most likely diagnosis. And you're like, all right, I think I can figure this out. I hope so. So then you go, Dressler syndrome. Oh, Jesus, I can't remember that. That's some autoimmune thing, I think. Then you go, oh, Jesus, shock. I don't even know where the apostrophe goes. <laughs> you're like, holy crap. Then you go acute pericarditis, and you might not have been thinking about that, but then you realize, ah, because you saw the birth control pill right up front, so you're thinking maybe PE, but now you're looking at it and you're realizing, ah, oral contraceptives, possibly a red herring in here. By the way, they won't do dirty red herrings. The red herrings will be things that are really, really common, and being on birth control pills is a really, really common thing for reproductive women, so that's a totally fair red herring, totally fair, but the rest of the question, Sounds like acute pericarditis, right? Gradual onset, worse when she lies flat. Remember that thing? When they lie back, the pain gets worse. And so now, you're, and it's gradual onset, not like a PE. That's sudden onset. All right, so you're like, C is alive. I got a question on B. I vaguely remember something about A. So then you go PE, and we've already convinced ourselves that PE is not what they're after. We've already deduced that the birth control pills are likely a red herring because this is gradual onset, myalgias, that just doesn't sound like a PE. So we've already taken, we've recognized that we're trying to serve us up PE with the birth control pills, but we've abandoned it. And then Tietze syndrome, you're like, Jesus. So you can see that the quality of the foils has a lot to do with how hard this question is. All right, so when you look at this, you begin to realize that oral contraceptives is a red herring not, you're not supposed to bite on that. It's a really common, totally fair game red herring. And the rest of this sounds like pericarditis. Even if you didn't know what Chagas disease is, a lot like mongoose, you should be like, I don't think they want me to bite on that, really? And you should be able to get to this even if you didn't know everything about the question. The real trick is to not get drawn into the PE thing. Then there are these two-parters. I really resent two-parters when I'm taking an exam because if I know the first part, I feel like I should get half credit. Well, they don't give you half credit. You have to get the second part right to get any credit. So a hiker from Connecticut presents with a Bell's palsy and a rash, Lyme disease. I'm like, I got the first part. Obviously, it's not uh, a Bell's palsy anymore because Bell's means you don't know what the cause is. It's Lyme disease. And then you go, oh, now I have to remember which which agent to treat Lyme disease with. You're like, oh crap. I mean, I look these things up, don't you? 
when I got a weird bug, I look up what drug works. I don't know them. So I'm a little pissed off at the examiner. But let's just go through it. So I got to figure this out. Amoxicillin, 500 TID for 10 days. Could be. I don't know. Head CT and NSAIDs, that never treated anything. So B is out. Bactrim, that's a broad spectrum drug. That could be it. And then I got some valcyclovir. Well, it's not viral. I know that. So D and E are out. And so I'm left with A and C. And what I see is a lot of people just go, well, I'll just pick one. No, 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 no. You're not done analyzing them. That's not all the information that's there. It's amoxicillin for 10 days and Bactrim for three days. Well, I don't know a lot about Lyme disease, but I know people get all these things with chronic problems and stuff like that. We don't know if the infection's cleared. I know all that. What's the chances that that's something you treat with three days? Uh-uh. So if you looked at that just, so I want to point out that sometimes information you sort of thought was irrelevant was actually very relevant. So you're, think, you're focusing in on what the agent is, but the duration of treatment that they offer up is actually fairly informative. There's no way I'd go with Bactrim BID for three days. That's urinary tract, something that gets better like this kind of treatment, not for this infection that can be in the CNS. And by the way, when they have a Bell's palsy, we're worried about CNS Lyme disease, they're gonna need longer. And so even here, where I don't memorize these things, I look them up just like you do, I think you ought to be able to, by doing good FOIL analysis, improve your guessing. So remember, it's not about reading the stem over and over again. Yes, read it carefully. Yes, make sure you haven't twisted it. L yes, make sure you're asking the actual question they answered. But most of the work in being a good guesser is down below in really doing the an analysis of the different choices that have been offered up to you. Many people, just many test takers, and particularly bad test takers, don't spend any time analyzing the choices. They just read the question, they go, I don't know what the answer is. They briefly glance at things and they don't really get into it and say if they can break it down. You gotta do the work analyzing the foils. When I first was taking tests, I thought these questions were horrible. Then when I wrote tests, I learned a little bit about them, and now I look forward to them. You see a test question that looks like this. And my thoughts are, what? It's reading comprehension? Remember, the other guy told you that some of this information you'll only hold in your mind for 15 to 30 seconds. If they give you three paragraphs, that's hard. But now that I know more and have written a lot of test questions, I know what this is about. I know that whenever you see a paragraph like this, it's about camouflage. It usually means it's an easy question. They're going to try and disguise an easy question in a lot of bullshit. So let's go on our bullshit hunting tour here. A 75-year-old man, I got one key fact, old. Weakness, they all have weakness. Dizziness, of course he does. Nausea, sure as shit. Me too. With ataxia, whoop, whoop, whoop. Remember I've told you to keep an eye out for ataxia. It's not a, you know, that's a hard neural finding. Ataxia, all right, I got old and ataxia. He's confused, yeah, they all are. Unable to provide, I can understand what the history will be like. Sir, how are you feeling today? All right, great. Okay. And then uh, I'll ask to sniff if they remembered the pulse form and they'll look at me. Pulsed? And then I want to shoot myself because um, I'll have no idea what I'm talking about. Now, they go on. I go, he's unable to provide past medical history or family information. Thank you for that. That's very useful to me. He denies seizures. Okay. I thought he was confused. But anyway, he denies seizures. And they go on to say, and he has no evidence of tongue biting, but his pants are soaked with urine. What are they after here? I got it. He doesn't have seizures. He didn't bite his tongue. Oh. He's incontinent. Or maybe he just forgot to put on his diaper this morning from the skilled nursing facility. His EKG is normal. Thank you so much. I was going to order one right away. Which diagnostic approach? Now when I get to the question, I'm even more ticked off. Which diagnostic approach will have the highest yield? I have no idea what he has. So you could give up here, and that's what happens with a lot of bad test takers. They kind of give up. I have no idea what they're talking about. They just kind of go down and circle one. No, we got work to do. So let's go down and do the work. 
Sort of what I got is old and ataxic and he was incontinent. So let's go down there. A said rate to rule out temporal arteritis. Well, temporal arteritis is the headache thing with the lumps on the side of the head, with possible blindness. There's no mention of any of that. He's old enough to have it, have it but it's women more than men. Um, it doesn't sound that good. So I'll just, I, I don't have enough to say it's definitely not that, but I don't know what it has to do with the incontinence. Then they, then they ask you, a head CT to assess for normal pressure hydrocephalus. Huh. Normal pressure hydrocephalus, what is that? Then you go, I vaguely remember some triad for that. I think it had a taxi in it. I think it had dementia in it. You're like, huh. And now you've convinced yourself you've learned something. That's the best thing possible in an exam. You just re-reminded yourself what normal pressure hydrocephalus is. It's an old person with ataxia, dementia, and incontinence. And you're like, hey, that might be it. But hang on, I don't want to jump too soon because clearly I'm fishing. If I just think I learned an answer, you can't be too content with that. <laughs> that would be like trusting a car salesman. You'd be like, yeah, I want that Saturn sedan badly. No, you don't. All right, so I, I think it might be that. Now I'm going to go down. LFTs to rule out hepatic encephalopathy. Nothing sounds like hepatic encephalopathy here. Then they ask a CPKBB. Remember the old days? There was CK, CPK MB and BB. You're like, CPKBB? Who wants me to order? I'd never order one of those. To rule out stroke? That's crazy talk. So C and D are out. Carotid angiogram for barrieraneurysm. Well, old people can get them, but they don't present like this. This is, you know, they're, you know. So now I got A, didn't sound right, C, D, and E. So even though I had, had total confusion about this, once I realized that it's a long stem, and therefore I have to find out what's important in that stem, there's never going to be more than three or four things. You're looking for the three or four things in that stem that are important. And here's what they are. If they just said an old person with ataxia, dementia, and incontinence, those are the four things. It's an old person with this triad. That's normal pressure hydrocephalus. That would be too easy. So instead of doing that, they camouflaged it in the whole rest of that thing and then tried to come up with a weird way to ask it that was a little backwards and inverted, all of which was meant to throw you off the scent. Now when I'm a test taker and I see one of those long questions, I am not intimidated because I've written them myself. I know what the game is. It's all about camouflage. And then a little bit of foil analysis will often get you to the end safely. Now you would like to think, because there are some concept questions that you're doing a research for your specialty. Can't they just ask me if I know the concepts of my specialty? You know, I'm not, why would I be mired down in these details? The problem is, is that concept questions are really hard to write. There aren't that many of them. They're really hard to write. Concept questions you can figure out, but they're hard to write, so there aren't many of them. So which of the following organs is susceptible to barotrauma? Well, barotrauma, I know the dive things. It's all about changes in volumes of gas with pressure. There's Boyle's Law and Henry's Law, and it's all those P's and V's with lines between them and dividing, and yeah, I remember that. Okay, the liver? No, it's got no air in it. The spleen? Might as well be the liver. It's just on the wrong side and smaller. No air in it. Sinuses? Yeah, yeah. I know people get sinus problems with that. People get sinus squeezes and sin I remember, in fact, I remember when I was, went to 165 feet in our, in our dive chamber at LA County USC, the one out on Catalina, we had a kid who had a cold who should have said he didn't want to go, but he went and he got air trapped in his maxillary sinus and he couldn't clear it when we were rising from 165 feet and so his sinus blew up in his face. It was very unpleasant. Blood squirting out in his eye. He looked in agony. We were like, I don't want to do that again. Spinal cord, no air there, heart, and so you, you could figure this one out. It's a concept question and go with sinuses, and then if you're me, I would circle the question and write back to the examiners. Why? The sinuses aren't an organ, you assholes. It's a bad question. I want it dropped if I didn't get it right. I don't want to talk about the research questions. All right, so 
you guys are at a time where you can, as you take exam questions, do practice questions, and I don't care whether you're getting them from the 1200 question book, or from the peer exams, or from Challenger, or from some of the practice questions that we do here, or wherever, but as you do practice questions, when you encounter something like, you know, Eaton-Lambert syndrome, and you don't remember what it is, or, or hypercalcemia as a perineoplastic syndrome, and you can't remember, just go and, and gather up that list of what are your own personal killer foils. Because what's killer foils for you may not be for you. What's a killer foil for you depends on sort of what you know already and what you're weak on. So everyone's gonna have their own list. And this is a great way to direct your studying because as you make this list of things that you stumbled on while you're doing practice questions, and then you go and read, get a, just try and get yourself a little three or four bullet points of biz buzz, Here's what normal pressure hydrocephalus is. Here's what Eaton Lambert is. Here's what, you know, one of these monoamine oxidase inhibitor drugs is. Things that you stumbled on, and what will happen is you are immediately filling in gaps in your knowledge, but it's not just any gaps. It's gaps that exam item writers were using as foils. And because coming up with an unlimited number of lists of wrong answers is really hard, Foils tend to repeat themselves across everyone who writes exams. And so it becomes a very powerful way to study. And the other thing I would just tell you is start by studying in the areas you don't like. If you like orthopedics, don't study that till the end because you'll learn it really quickly. If you hate hemonc, start there. That's where you start. You despise these room things. I can never remember what's got 10 joints, what's got, you know, start there. You've forgotten all the peds GI. You're like, I hate those polyp things, Poots Jaeger and the things and the spots and the HHT. Start there. Start with the stuff that you don't like and collect killer foils and do practice questions. And that's generally speaking, when I've worked with residents who are struggling with this, been enough to get them to pass. It, it, I, honest to God, I can tell you without changing your knowledge base by much, this is good for 10 to 15 points on an exam becoming a better guesser, working hard with your FOIL analysis alone is good for seven, eight points on an exam. So learn those, get a list. I put a list in there of some killer FOILs, but you don't have to use that list. I think the most powerful list is the list you create on your own. All right, thank you very much.